All right, thanks, Jane. Um, Corey's kind of difficult to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to present on uh, a number of, of, of national and international issues that we see affecting the medium-term outlook for the rural sector, and I want to talk a bit about um, the opportunities um, that present themselves to Australian agriculture and some of the challenges in taking advantage of those. And the first challenge will be to set this up right. So our commodity forecasts are based on a set of um, macroeconomic assumptions and it's useful um, to run through those as they uh, drive some of the changes we're expecting to see and I promise to do this quickly. So economic growth is a key assumption uh, and we're forecasting a pretty slow recovery uh, in world growth in the medium term from 3.1% last year. That was the lowest level of world growth since 2009. And our latest forecasts are assuming that that growth is going to fall further in 2016 to 2.9%. And then we expect a gradual strengthening to about 3.5% by 2021. In OECD countries, so the developed world, we're expecting growth is going to remain below 2% a year. Um, but China uh, is going to remain a driver of world growth. Um, but we're assuming growth there is going to slow to less than 6% a year. Um, but even at, even at that level, the absolute increase um, in demand in China is sufficient to drive output in other economies, and that's going to be especially important to some of those emerging um, economies in Asia. But there are some downside risks in China around their equity markets, uh, potential devalu devaluation of the currency there, and their econo ongoing economic reform programs. So they, they add an element of fragility to that global outlook. Now, obviously, the exchange rate assumption is important, uh, and the assumption underlying our forecasts is that the dollar will average 73 US cents in 16-17. That's largely unchanged from what it averaged last year. It's currently a bit stronger than that, at around 75 cents, and, of course, we can expect some volatility around that through the year. Now, that compares with a 2014-15 a average of 84 cents, and it's well below the 10-year average of 89 cents. So the, the exchange rate's been driven down largely by a decline in our terms of trade uh, that reflects weaker prices for energy and mineral commodities on world markets. Now, we're expecting that the value of agricultural production increased in 2015-16 to about $58 billion. That compares to $54 billion dollars the year before. Uh, there's a positive story for crops in there in that we've had increases in the volume of production on the back of good seasonal conditions in most areas and that's offset falling global prices. And for livestock, high prices have nearly offset a fall in the volume of production as herd numbers have contracted over the last couple of years. So we're expecting a similar value of agricultural production overall in real terms um, this year, provided seasonal conditions remain favourable. Now, the weaker dollar in 2015-16 increased average export prices across the board. We're expecting that farm export earnings uh, stayed at around $44 billion in 2015-16. So the benefits of the depreciation of the dollar uh, was offset by a fall in livestock export volumes. And then for this year, we're forecasting that export earnings are going to fall to around $43 billion in real terms, um, with some softening in international prices. Now, some of the specific um, commodity movements we see over the next year are increases in the value of wool and sugar because of higher export volumes and higher world prices as demand firms. Lower export values are forecast for beef following a decline in the national herd that's affected volumes available for export. But prices are expected to remain high because of strong international demand and the, well, and the relatively um, weak Australian dollar. In the case of wheat, we're forecasting a fall in the value of exports as a result of lower world prices. That's despite forecast increases in Australian wheat production and export volumes. 
And as we look further ahead to 2021, we expect that the value of crop exports will be stable as higher volumes largely offset lower world prices. So short of significant drought or un other unforeseeable impacts on production, we expect world supplies to be plentiful and to put downward pressure on crop prices over the medium term. And our forecast for the value of livestock exports is also um, for similar levels. Increasing turnoff as the herd expands, but more competition in export markets is likely to place some downward pressure on prices. Now we're reasonably optimistic about the medium term outlook. So food demand in Asia is expected to increase because of larger population, growth in incomes and increasing urbanisation, uh, especially in India, uh, China and Southeast Asia. So agri-food consumption is projected to double by 2050. Uh, a bit over 70% of that is in Asia. And of that, almost two thirds is in China. So given its importance, we've had a close look at the prospects for food demand in China by separating consumers there into three groups. Urban high income consumers, urban middle income and rural consumers. So a factor influencing um, food consumption patterns has been urbanisation, which you can see here has increased significantly over the last few decades. And a key driver of that's been the difference between urban and rural incomes. Urban incomes in China were around twice as high as rural incomes in 1990 and around three times higher in 2010. And it's expected that those disparities in per person income um, in China are going, are going to continue. So with higher incomes, urban consumers spend more on food than rural consumers and have a more diverse, higher value diet. In China, per person expenditure on food in urban areas is about three times higher than it is in rural areas. Per person consumption of meat is about 75% higher in urban areas, and for dairy products, it's about 400% higher. In contrast, per person consumption of cereals is about 55% lower in urban areas. So with continued urbanisation, changes in food consumption patterns towards diversification of diets is expected to continue. And you can see from the slide that by 2050, we project significant increases in consumption of cereals, oil seeds, beef, dairy products, and sugar and leading that growth will be urban consumers. So among China's urban population, higher income consumers are expected to account for the largest increase in consumption for many agricultural products, especially high value products like beef and dairy products, as well as vegetables. And although agricultural production in China is also projected to increase significantly by 2050, it's unlikely to satisfy the increase in food consumption, providing opportunities for global exporters of food products. China's import demand for agricultural product products is expected to rise toward 2050 for the group of commodities you see here, uh, as well as some others. In contrast, um, consumption of rice, pork and poultry are likely to be met mainly by increases in domestic production. So Asia presents substantial market opportunities for Australian exporters, but there will be strong competition. So you can see here, Australia has numerous competitors on world, for world agricultural exports, each vying for space in those markets. Maintaining or increasing our market share requires that we at least maintain our international competitiveness, which means continued productivity growth. Now we're really interested in, in profits, but as we've got limited influence over prices on world markets, it's been productivity growth that's provided protection against the long-term decline in the farmer's terms of trade. And agricultural productivity growth has been, growing, has, been, has been strong historically, both in terms of comparisons with agricultural sectors in other countries, but also in terms of comparisons across sectors in the Australian economy. But it has been slowing, and it's been slowing since about the mid-1990s. 
A similar slowdown has been identified elsewhere uh, in Western Europe, New Zealand, Canada and the US. Uh, it's obvious that, that drought has been important here, but that doesn't explain all of the slowdown in productivity growth. It looks like a decline in the growth of public R&D expenditure has also been a factor. And changing rainfall patterns is one of our big challenges. Uh, this map produced by AGIC shows what's been happening over the last 15 years compared to the historical record and the end result of which is a contraction in the area suitable for dryland cropping. Now in our own work we're seeing greater deterioration in productivity along the inland fringes of the cropping zone. So if climatic conditions stay this way or deteriorate further, then productivity gains uh, will be needed for farmers to offset this and remain internationally competitive. And that in turn is likely to require greater investment in R&D to adapt to climate change, improvements in seasonal forecasting, with, in seasonal forecasting to assist farm decision making and greater use of risk management tools to reduce financial risk are also likely to be important. So we need productivity to keep increasing, but there's a question as to whether the drivers that have underpinned productivity growth in the past will continue to contribute to the same degree in the future. So domestic policy reform over a long period has been important to productivity growth. But the boost to productivity that followed reforms such as dismantling price support schemes and reducing subsidies has largely run its course. While continued reform is important, it's unlikely to yield gains as substantial as those achieved historically because there isn't that much left to do. Our farmers are already the second least supported in the OECD um, after New Zealand. So opportunities to improve agricultural productivity and competitiveness will largely need to come from other sources and we're going to need to be careful about the costs of regulation. So the reforms outlined in this slide have been focused on output markets. But it's true that, reg that regulation of inputs has been increasing. And we're going to need to be careful to design regulation that achieves increasingly high environmental and other standards in ways that doesn't unnecessarily impede productivity. <clears throat> For example, in areas such as biodiversity conservation, the use of GM crops, animal welfare requirements and foreign ownership regulations. So while the community's got a, requite, a right to require farmers and all business owners to abide by particular standards, we need to be aware that there are costs associated with this and strive to find the least cost ways of meeting them. Structural adjustment in agriculture has been um, substantial and important to productivity growth and we can expect it to continue. So this shows the trend to large farms to the point where the largest 10% of farms, those with receipts greater than a million dollars a year, now produce about 50% of total output. Concentration has increased steadily over time and growth in large farms has come about mainly through the expansion of already large and medium sized farms rather than consolidation of small farms. Something like 50% of the increase in productivity since the late 1970s has come from this reallocation of resources to larger farms. So ensuring that government policies don't impede consolidation is going to be important to support productivity growth. Now this shows the share of output and the share of farm numbers by size. For example, the, the smallest size category there on the left accounts for less than 5% of receipts, but nearly 30% of farms by number. And as the size categories get bigger and we move to the right, the share of receipts rises and the share of farm numbers falls. So more than half of farm businesses in Australia are now small, and on average they've got low rates of return, um, often negative, and they rely heavily on off-farm income. Our farm surveys data shows that on average the smallest 50% of farms derive 88% of their household disposable income from off-farm sources. But that doesn't mean that small farms don't have a future in Australian agriculture. They'll probably increase in number, if not in output, 
because they tend to be supported by off-farm income as well as the lifestyle benefits associated with owning farmland. Now, although there's no, there's no hard data, we're seeing reports of an increasing number of transactions in Australian agriculture by corporate investors, so private equity firms, fund managers, sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds. And that's led to some debate about the, the future of the traditional family farm. Now, information from the farm surveys that ABARES conducts shows that the sources of investment in Australian agriculture has been very stable over a long period. Around 60 to 70 per cent of investments been provided directly by the owners of family farms, so the green portions down the bottom. Debt fundings accounted for about 14 per cent, it's the red bars at the top, and the remaining roughly 20 per cent in the middle is other forms of equity. Now we can't break that category down any further, but it includes investment by family members other than the owner and their spouse and through company structures used by family farms. So if you remove those, it means that investment by the genuinely corporate sector is significantly less than the 20% included in this category. And the relatively constant share of those categories over time suggests there's been little transfer of farm assets from families to corporate investors over the past 20 years, despite all of the reports of corporate acquisitions. It suggests instead that farms have mostly been traded between corporate entities rather than from families to corporates. Now, increased corporate investment in agriculture has the potential to bring some significant advantages. Their threshold levels of investment tend to be high, their access, their access to capital can increase the capacity to invest in technology and improve productivity, and their capital backers are sometimes willing to take risks that family farmers can't afford. So a reasonable question might be why we aren't seeing more corporate activity. And part of the answer might lie in the rate of return being achieved by corporate investment in agriculture. So return on capital invested does vary by sector and by region, but there's also a difference in performance between family farms and the corporates. When we look at broadacre and dairy, uh, except in the case of beef, Family farm structures have outperformed the corporate sector in terms of operating returns, uh, especially in cropping. And the beef results probably reflect the greater exposure of, north, of, of corporate farms in northern Australia, where the average farm is much larger than in the south. These results are consistent with what's been found in the United States. And the most likely explanation for the superior performance of family farms is that they're operated by the people that own them and who've got very strong incentives to maximise returns while managing exposure to risk and to do that with a relatively long-term view. The challenge for corporates is designing incentives for managers and workers that encourage them to work hard, cut costs and take advantage of opportunities in the same way that owner-operators do. Even though those workers can have a limited, um, if any, equity stake in the business. Now that's especially hard to do in farming because random changes in things like the weather, commodity prices, pest and disease pressures can have big impacts on profits, but they can be very difficult to distinguish from those caused by variation in management skill or work commitment. So in summary, we're expecting the value of production and exports to remain relatively high in the next few years underpinned by slower but still good growth in China. There's certainly opportunities for increased food consumption in Asia, but competition for those markets will be fierce, so we need to keep improving productivity. The structural changes that we've seen in agriculture in the past can be expected to continue, as can the attention that agriculture is receiving in terms of potential new investment. But it seems unlikely that the source of investment funding will change substantially. It will remain largely owner-operator equity and debt held by banks. And the owner-operator model is likely to dominate for a long time to come. But given the opportunities that exist, there will be continued interest from new sources of capital. And it's important they understand the risk profile of the various sectors within agriculture. Thanks for your time.